When talking about the Shakespeare authorship question, there are many different names put forward as to who could have written the plays, including, obviously, that of Shakespeare himself. What I don't hear many people talking about, though, was why, if the author was not Shakespeare, somebody would have been ghostwriting under the name of Shakespeare or using a real man, an actor called Shakespeare, as their foil. So in this video, I'm going to attempt to answer that question, and I will also be showing you some things concealed in the works of Shakespeare and the sonnets later on. First of all, though, I do need to just do a quick whiz through some very basic astronomy. Just why astronomy is important to this will become only too apparent in a minute. Now, many people know that in ancient times there was worship of the life-giving, eternal light, the sun. Veneration of the sun as a deity goes back to, at minimum, the 14th century BC. But what many people are not as aware of is that the only two planets to lie between the sun and our orbit here on Earth are Mercury and Venus. As such, these two stay close to the sun on its travels across the celestial canopy as we view them from here down on Earth, and consequently they were also highly revered. While there are three other planets which are visible to the naked eye appearing to move across the sky, namely Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, the movement of those planets is considerably slower and they can spend long periods away from appearing to be close to the rising or the setting sun. Mercury and Venus, however, always appear to rise and set in fairly close proximity to the sun, never straying very far from it at all. This is because Mercury will never be found more than 28 degrees away from the Sun and Venus is never more than 47 degrees. Hence, both Venus and Mercury were regularly seen as morning and evening stars and they were known as heralds, particularly Mercury because it more often came close to the Sun and it moved more swiftly. So if you saw Mercury in the pre-dawn sky, you knew that it heralded that the Sun and its light could not be very far behind. Here is Mercury rising exactly with the Sun, and obviously as it comes over the horizon, the Sun's glare would make Mercury invisible. So I'd like you to remember that word invisible in respect to Mercury, because we will be coming back to it shortly. Now because of the speed and proximity of these two inner planets, which obviously in ancient times were not even known to be planets, but were seen as wandering stars, all sorts of mythology arose around them. This trio, the Sun, Mercury and Venus, became the focus of many myths about trinities, groups of three. These have lasted throughout time. Now I should just add for the sake of correctness that there was another reason for the reverence of trinities which has to do with the three different rising positions of the Sun at three important stages throughout the year. But here we're just focusing on the Sun, Mercury and Venus. Perhaps one of the most ancient of the trinities that we know about relating to this trio is their association with Osiris, Isis and Horus. Osiris was a personification of the Sun and Isis a representation of Venus and Horus of Mercury. Now mythology is an incredibly convoluted subject as each culture had various interpretations for their heavenly bodies and their movements so you should also know that Isis was sometimes seen as the receptive moon. The moon receiving as she does the Sun's light which is why we have moonshine and thus both moon and Venus were seen as the divine feminine counterpart to the masculine creative sun energy. Whilst Mercury was perceived as vast and therefore youthful, but was also masculine and so it was seen as a smaller son of the sun. And you can see there's a natural play on words here. Now Mercury being much faster than Venus and also of the two it was the one which more regularly went into what seemed to the naked eye like reverse motion known as retrograde motion so it was really seen here and there and it became known as the swift messenger or the winged messenger symbolic of its nature of darting between the Sun and Venus and seeming to carry their light. 
Additionally, you need to know that because of Mercury's appearance in both east and west at morning and night, and the fact that it was often seen with the brightest planet, Venus, this further led to its paired or dualistic symbolism, and also at times to its perceived androgyny. The ancient Greeks called it Apollo when seen in the morning sky and Hermes when seen in the evening sky. In myth, the constellation Gemini was linked to twins. This was due to the paired nature of the bright stars, twin stars, Castor and Pollux. Thus Mercury, with its dual nature, was also associated with this sign and actually, as a quick aside, it also became associated with Virgo because that constellation was situated on the other side of the two constellations which represented the home of the Moon, Cancer, and the home of the Sun, Leo. So Mercury was symbolically seen like two pillars on either side of the great lights of the Sun and the Moon. For all these reasons and many more, Mercury became the prime symbol of the ancient mystery schools. In the Castor and Pollux myth, one twin was mortal, the other immortal, and they were brothers. And you might know that secret wisdom schools were called brotherhoods. As there was clearly some form of a creator or organising force residing in the heavenly sphere, this was seen as a supreme being, the Father God whose handiwork was made visible through the works of Mother Nature on Earth. Therefore, through this symbolism, Mercury came to represent a mediator between God and mortals. In fact, Mercury represented all of the dual unities that you can think of above and below, within and without, and in everything, because everything has a counterpart. So there's hot and cold, up and down, North Pole, South Pole, day and night, summer and winter, life and death, good and evil, incoming, outgoing, and of course, knowledge and ignorance, etc. Flitting as it did between Venus and the Sun, Mercury became the embodiment of the one who not only carried the light of knowledge, but also of love. This dual unity symbolism is the real reason why you will see the two men on one horse on the Templar seal, and why Mercury is associated with Hermes, Thoth, Horus and Jesus, the Son of God, as they are messenger teachers who carry truth from immortal God to mortal man. So now that that quick celestial and mythological primer is over, and I should just add that some of this can get really, really confusing, I realise that, as there are so many syncretisms of mythologies, but it's all discussed in more detail in my ebook, The Secret Work of an Age. Now you know all this though, we can return to that opening question. Whether you believe Marlowe, De Vere, Bacon, somebody else or a group of people really wrote the plays, if it wasn't Shakespeare, what on earth were they up to? The answer can be found in this man, Francis Bacon. Whilst known as a lawyer and statesman, he was also a high initiate of the mystery tradition and through his work with Queen Elizabeth I's intelligence service, he was also a master cryptographer. He developed many ciphers. He was also known to have had an association with John Dee. He was also an imperator of the Rosicrucians. And one interpretation of the word rose leads us to that all-important word, love. Now remember I asked you to take note of the word invisible when thinking of Mercury being in the heart of the sun. Venus would spend time in the heart of the sun too, by the way, from time to time, but we're talking here about Mercury. And the Rosicrucians were known by the name of the invisibles. Their work was done for the good of humanity and not to draw attention to themselves. The light was more important. The Rosicrucians and their colleges were a group of unseen secret philosophers with knowledge of the ancient mystery tradition. 
and in the 1500s Francis Bacon took on the crown as the philosopher king from those great philosophers who had gone before him in the mystery school tradition. This is a tradition that we can trace right back to the Egyptians and to those from the Middle and Far East. Acting as the messenger or carrier of light, i.e. a modern day Apollo or Hermes, please note what is on screen now. Bacon and his invisible college of good pens set out to carry the tradition of the ancient wisdom schools from east to west and to bring the light of truth to the whole world. They set out to do this by educating mankind to our universal commonalities and lifting us up in a secular fashion to understand about God's works through nature. This was why Bacon's great inspiration was in six parts, in imitation of the six-day work of God's creation. And in fact, the full name of his Rosicrucian College was the College of the Six Days Work. In his introduction to this great inspiration or resurrection of knowledge of nature's laws by which we can discover God's works and therefore discover truths about man and the universe, Bacon said, God is the truth and reality which sustains the universe. This truth animates all things. It is the spiritual principle in all life. He also said the inquiry of truth is the love making or the wooing of it. And he said, the mind is the man, and the knowledge is the mind. A man is but what he knoweth. The purpose of knowledge is to know truth, and truth experienced turns knowledge to wisdom. And this is where the infamous knowledge is power comes from. Bacon's work was to lead mankind beyond their current limited understanding as they had learned from the men of dogmas and lead them to become more free thinking, to know their own power and to have knowledge of love and loving kindness as a state of being. In this way he saw himself as a herald of a new time, a herald of a great renewal or restoration of learning about the arts, sciences and human knowledge. He was telling people to set out on a journey of rediscovery of the truth, hence the voyaging boats here. His revealed work was as a founder of the scientific method, but in line with the mystery school's duality, the concealed work was through the use of metaphor and allegory and other devices in the Shakespeare plays. These were plays which would inspire and ignite the imagination to ponder the moral and perennial philosophical questions of life. In his advancement of learning, Bacon said, that the ancients used plays as a means of educating men's mind to virtue. At that time, however, anyone in a high position could not be seen to be openly associated with playwriting. Indeed, poets and dramatists wrote works anonymously for fear of what it might do to their positions and careers. Here's what Bacon himself said about it. There is no better way to achieve this philosophical instruction and to bypass the restrictions and BDI of those who sought to censor content and punish anything that sounded remotely heretical or treasonous than for the invisible fraternity to work together to open and illuminate men's minds by penning a number of plays, all dealing with the comedies, tragedies and histories that every one from all walk of life could find deeper meaning in for centuries and indeed millennia to come. Shaking a spirit ignorance, just like Apollo's counterpart, the goddess Athena, who sometimes interchanges with Venus, was achieved through writing, editing and collating the plays into the book that we know today as the first folio. The double truth of the plays was there for anyone who contemplated their deeper meaning and saw that they could be read on two levels, known as piercing the veil. 
You'll also note that in Shakespeare there are copious references to dreams and sleep. Sleep was known as the lesser mystery and death the greater mystery. But the fundamental teaching is of the immortality of the soul. The body is just a temporary cloak and an understanding of the marriage of our divinity and mortality while still alive is the origin of the mystical premise to die before you die and find there is no death. If one can achieve this during life, then this type of enlightenment can allow one to live a heaven on earth until one's physical, mortal death, but the soul lives on. In the final analysis then, it's as simple as that. The entire mystery of Shakespeare is about wanting to enlighten those in the dark who were seeking light and about making good men better. It was a project for the moral and philosophical improvement of man and a return to a golden age. And by man and men, I obviously mean women too, of course. Like everything put out by the secret orders, they can be read on many levels and sometimes you won't even know that you're being instructed or educated. Allegories, allusions, riddles, puns, rhymes, parables, symbols and archetypes are multi-leveled and they all play on our mind. One's level of spiritual unfoldment allows the eyes and ears to perceive things as if by osmosis that the less developed soul may yet have to grasp. But just as once a seed is planted, it will one day, if tended, flourish. The works of Shakespeare were designed to be read over and over, and each time to yield a new insight for all. They were intended to invoke the whole gamut of emotions and to impart great wisdom about life, light and love. Now we don't know for sure to what extent Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, may have been involved in all of this during his lifetime, but he was definitely part of what's known as the Essex Group, named after the Earl of Essex, Robert Devereux. This was a group which included nobles and a circle of dramatists, poets and writers. There is no doubt that Edward Oxenford was a noted poet and a patron of poets and dramatists. My personal feeling is that although Bacon was the mastermind, a group effort may explain why so many feel that de Vere had some hand in some of the plays that ended up in the folio. But as de Vere died in 1604, 19 years before the first folio was printed in 1623, plus he doesn't have a very good rap if you care to read up about him, plus he was very sparsely eulogised after his death, I do have to say that I'm just really throwing a crumb to the Oxfordians by including this. For what is without doubt is that Bacon was the main man and I'm going to show you things now that will support that view. So you've heard a lot about duality and the twin nature of Mercury and obviously this relates to the number two. As you can see by this picture now on screen, you may think I'm going to start talking about threes. But while threes are hugely important in the mystery tradition, double A3 is two threes next to each other. People naturally see it as the number 33, but in its purest symbolism, it represents this, the two threes next to each other. And I explain all about the different symbolisms of number cipher in my ebook. But three is the number of sides in a triangle and another cipher is the letter A, which when doubled becomes the AA sigil or a visual cipher for two triangles and two three threes, so three three next to each other. But sometimes the AA, as you can see down here, is shown as AV because then they are representing both an upward and downward pointing open triangle. When the A and V are intertwined, they produce a close representation of the Masonic square and compass symbol. And also when they're fully intertwined, a six pointed star known in masonry as one of the three blazing stars. And yes, there are three stars, not one, which again, you can read about all in my ebook. 
So the letter A has been utilised as a cipher by the mystery school since at least the 2nd century AD, having as it does the association with alpha and the upwards pointing triangle. But the first time the AA cipher appeared in print was in a book owned by Francis Bacon called the Alphabetum Hebraicum. Now Bacon was known by many names. One of these was the third Plato and it was Ficino who was the second Plato. But as you've heard, another name Bacon was known by was Apollo who was Hermes' half-brother. So again we see this Mercury Brotherhood symbolism everywhere. Apollo had a twin called Artemis, twin and double A theme again, but it was Athena, also known as Minerva, who was said to have been born fully formed from their father Zeus's head carrying a spear and shield. And this is who the AA sigil most often refers to. The A's represent Apollo and Athena. As mentioned earlier, Athena is the goddess of wisdom who shakes her spear at ignorance. So the double A headpiece, with one A being in the light and one in the dark, acts as another secret cipher for the secret work of the invisible philosophical Rosicrucian colleges. Highly symbolically and very importantly, the headpiece first appeared with the first ever mention of William Shakespeare in print, and this was on the play Venus and Adonis in 1593. Then it was in Hamlet in 1603 and the Sonnets in 1609, and of course, as you can see here, it was in the first folio in 1623. Here it is in the Sonnets. And what this all indicates, in code, hidden in plain sight, was that Bacon wrote Shakespeare, because Apollo is Bacon and Athena is shaking her spear. Note that this is why the word Shakespeare is split into two words. This mercurial meaning of the concealed and revealed poet and light and dark of wisdom and ignorance is present throughout the sonnets and the first folio. In the first folio, there is a trail of further clues for those with the eyes to see, and I'm going to give you a taste of those now. Before I do so, though, I would just like to draw your attention to more cipher here on this page. And I'd also just like to say that in my videos and my ebook, I deliberately place a lot of the most interesting information towards the end. And I do this because it whittles out the true seeker from the false. It is a well-known part of the wisdom tradition that only those who are truly desiring to seek the light will stay the course and make the journey through information to understanding and won't expect it all to be handed to them neatly on a platter with little effort. So as you have listened this far, I'd like to say well done because you're now going to start hearing some of the really interesting stuff. So on the page opposite the famous engraving of Shakespeare at the beginning of the first folio is a well-known passage from Bacon's very close friend, Ben Jonson. It's known as To the Reader. Unsurprisingly, it focuses on the dual symbolism the concealed and revealed of Mercury, God of Communication. So here you can see that Ben Jonson is asking us to place our attention on the book. And when we do so, we see that he has drawn our attention to the word to, to the reader, and to the word spelt out, T-W-O, in a cross stick down the side. But also, each sentence ends in the same two letters. And this is asking us to look at the first two, and the two letters, U and T. U has a value of 20 and T has a value of 19. When we add them together, that makes 39. 33 is the cipher for the name Bacon and F is 6. 33 plus 6 is 39. So Ben Johnson is leading us to the name of the author F. Bacon. Also, looking at the two initials, which stand like two pillars here, 
Whilst his name is written out in full elsewhere, here Ben Johnson signs his name B.I. In the alphabet at that time, J and I were the same, they were interchangeable. So whether written as B.J. or B.I., these are the two letters which are known in the Bible and to every Mason as Boaz and Jachin, the left and right hand pillars at the porch of Solomon's temple. Freemasonry and Rosicrucian colleges were inextricably intertwined, as I explain in my ebook. So Ben Johnson is asking us to look for twos, and not only is this a metaphor for the mercurial concealed and revealed, hence why when we look at the engraving of Shakespeare, it looks like the head is actually a mask. You'll see that by the line here. And the body is facing two ways. One arm looks like it's facing to the front and the other looks as if we're looking from the back. But additionally, what we can see here is the Gemini glyph and the chin is forming the top part of the glyph and this unusual shape rough is forming the bottom part. Now this rough is unusual in the way that it looks and it looks like a backward spade. Here you can see the meaning of the spade in Masonic symbolism. So this rough to those with the eyes to see is conveying that Shakespeare is the immortal twin to the true mortal author behind the mask, Bacon. If I just go back, you'll see you can read it down here that these rays are because Apollo is under the mask. Now, although Shakespeare is said to have written The Tempest last, interestingly, it was placed right at the very front of the works of William Shakespeare, i.e. the first folio. And it begins with this ornate B. The play has a character called a shipmaster and a botswain, which is a boatswain or a ship's petty officer. In the play, the names are truncated to mast and boats, which in itself is a bit of a word play. But the word master, as you can see here, is written in full above the block letter B, which is effectively the very first letter in the entire collection of plays. Now, B on one level is obviously there for Botswain, but on the second concealed level, B is for Bacon, and with the master standing above it, it reads Master B or Master Bacon. And Master is a name given to initiates of the mysteries such as Master Mason or Grand Master. Even more importantly, to keep the dual message going, the letter B in Bacon's Kabbalistic simple cipher stands for the number two. This along with Ben Johnson's repetition of the number two where he tells us to look on the book and it's written down the side, etc. means he seemed to be directing us to turn to page two. And when we do, the only word which stands out on page two, because it doesn't fit on the line, is the word down. So if we look more closely and follow this instruction to read down, we can see the acrostic F B A C O N F Bacon. Ben Johnson has led us again to the author's name. Now another thing to point out as well if we look at the block B is that back in 1931 an article appeared from a Baconian named Miss Covington in which she, she said that she had discovered that upon examination the ornate B at the start of the plays in the folio has the words Francis Bacon cleverly concealed in the curlicues around the letter. And sure enough if we do look it does appear to say Francis here and here and Bacon on the right. And there certainly is no other B like it in the folio. So this one is up to you whether you want to find this valid or not. But there are many secret ciphers in the folio. 
Not all of them are symbols or simple acrostics. Some involve letter substitution. Some involve drawing lines to connect letters. Another popular cipher of the era was simple anagrams or the doubling of letters like we saw with the 3-3. Three, three. This is a secret nod to the fact that there is a clue to be found in what one is looking at on the page. So as Ben Johnson is clearly telling us the number two for duality is so important, if we look at the page 222, what do we find? Well, straight away we can see that the number is not printed in an ordinary way. It has two in like a superscript. And if we leave out the first two lines and count down 22 lines, we come, and we seem to be being prompted by this here as well, a stage direction, we come to the word bacon in an acrostic, B-A-C-O-N. But in line with this duality of doing things in two ways, you can see here that we can leave out the N and we can just read down and back up again. So B-A-C-O-N is in here. Earlier I mentioned that double letters and figures are a secret cipher and TT actually means 33. If you spell out the word you'll see that TT is the first two letters of the words 30 and 3. So the fact that the first play is the Tempest which begins with T for the and T for Tempest and we note that there's a double T on the dedication on the sonnets, then it's clearly telling us that there's something to look at here. So yes, it may mean that the publisher's name, Thomas Thorpe, but that is the revealed meaning, the outward exoteric meaning. The concealed or esoteric meaning is always 33, Kabbalistic simple cipher for Bacon and for the twin pillars of the Temple of Solomon. But this TT here is clearly directing us to look at sonnet 33. And um, when we do so, what we find is that it's actually replete with cipher and code. So I'm going to have to leave you to visit the links at the end of this video. I'll put them up at the end of this video so you can see just how many codes and ciphers are in here. But I'm going to show you one of the main ones. You can see that it begins with this F and then this V11 rather than the U which was often substituted for a V, but you can see they've used the U here, so they could easily have used it here. So this is asking us to look more closely at it. The 1-1 one, one particularly looks like two pillars as well, drawing our attention to it. So this word full actually reads FV11, one, one, which is Roman numerals. So the F in K cipher is 32. If you add 7 for V11567, one, one, it makes 39, which is F bacon in simple cipher. And the Baconian Rob Fowler has also pointed out that F in simple cipher is 6. And if you put that next to 7, you get 67, which is Francis. If you count the number of characters after the F, it is 33. So whichever way you look at it, we're being led to the name Francis Bacon in Sonnet 33. Now one more to show you. If Francis is 67 and Bacon is 33, that adds up to 100. So if we go and look at page 100, which, by the way, is also uh, not only a cipher for Francis Bacon, but for a Grand Master. On page 100, in the second line, there are two words. So again, we've got this duality and the doubling all the time. And those two words are 33, which is cipher for the name Bacon. 
So in my ebook, The Secret Work of an Age, I explain how none of this was nefarious. It was all part of the Rosicrucian plan, who were at the time a completely invisible college of men working to uphold and transmit the wisdom of the ages, and whose plan it was to set in motion a general reformation of moral and philosophical knowledge with the goal to restore the world to a better state of purity, democracy and peace. The plan was set in motion between the supernovas of the late 1500s AD and the early 1600s when there were two very famous supernovas. The plan was spoken about in the Rosicrucian Manifestos and was finally delivered in 1623 in the first folio and this was the year of a highly important planetary conjunction between the planets Jupiter and Saturn. They were expert astronomers and they knew that 1623 and this meeting of Jupiter and Saturn, it was to be the closest that these two planets would come to an almost exact alignment in both right ascension and declination until the year 2020. A previous close conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn was said to have heralded the birth of Jesus, hence the bright star in the east that the wise men reportedly followed. And aside from the turning of the ages, known as procession of the equinoxes, again all of this mentioned in my ebook, this era between 1623 to 2020 was deemed to be an era when they would strive for a new understanding to take hold. They knew that through the works of Shakespeare they could spread insights and additionally a new universal language through the introduction of hundreds of new English words in a world of books that had largely been written in Latin. These words were to become infused throughout Western culture. This would be a book that would transcend any one religion and because of its timeless plays it would have longevity and effectively become immortal. It was going to be an educational work. Meanwhile the exoteric work, which as I say is the outward work compared to the esoteric hidden concealed work, was via the introduction to the world of the scientific method through the great instauration and the advancement of learning etc. which would bring people to a greater understanding of nature and her forces. So there you have it. They knew that by 2020, the next start of a new era, a new time, knowledge of these mystery schools and their mission would have started to come out of the shadows, aided along by those in the mystery schools who were in the know. And in doing so, the public revelation and recognition of the truth about the authorship of Shakespeare would cause people to have to rethink more deeply about their own lives and the bigger picture and why things had to be suppressed. Looking at the state of the world around us, especially since 2020, and the way so many people in the world still do not enjoy freedoms and there is so much divisiveness and religious intolerance. Understanding of the message of Bacon's plan couldn't be more timely as we approach the 400th anniversary of the first folio. We need to recognise that science and spirituality are not separate beings, but twin souls that need to be reunited so that a more universal religion of tolerance and love for our fellow brothers and sisters can emerge. Now I may do more videos on the ciphers in Shakespeare, but I highly recommend that you read my ebook to understand more about the symbolism of numbers. And I also highly recommend that you visit either one or all of these links to read up more about the work of Sir Francis Bacon and the Invisible College. Thank you very much for watching.